Well, hello there, my friends, and welcome back to another round of HS211, History of the Restoration Movement. In this module, we're going to discuss the concept of millennialism, and specifically the end-of-times theories of the early Restoration Movement. And this will be a very important uh, discussion because almost all of the early advocates of the Restoration Movement Thomas and Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, Walter Scott, Elias Smith, James O'Kelly, all of them will have one binding factor that they can all agree on, and that is the idea of what could be called post-millennialism, that this will be their end times eschatology that will drive both their reforming actions and their outlook for what they thought that their reform was trying to accomplish. And so, to set the stage for that, we're going to need to talk about, well, just what is an end times theory in general, and we'll begin by noting just how prevalent an end of the world idea is for just cultures in general, whether they be Christian or not. So, let me begin by asking this question. What do all four of these pictures have in common? Well, as I alluded to, that's right. They are reconstructions of what some people think the end of the world might look like. Now, let's take them from left to right here. In the top left, we have an atomic bomb blast basically destroying a very large city. And since 1945, this has been a very common end-time scenario for a lot of non-Christians in our culture, that there's been this idea of just there's going to be a large-scale nuclear war that is going to wipe out all of humanity. Now, as Christians, though, our millennial ideas and our end times ideas are wrapped up in the return of Christ. And so there in the lower left, we have a, a conquering version of the return of Christ, where Christ is riding out on his white horse using a lot of revelation imagery, that he is being followed by an army of angels also on white horses. And you notice there's just kind of this fire in his wake, and as he's going through the cities, there's fire and there's destruction. And so what we have here is a very militaristic understanding of the millennium, that when Christ comes back, he's coming back to kick butt and take names, as it were. But notice we also have a third one there in the upper right. And this is a return of Christ that is a much more peaceful endeavor. That this is a reconstruction where Christ is returning, angels are descending, and the people are just there waiting to receive him. What's What happens to the sinful? We don't really know, we don't really see in this picture. But here the artist is stressing something very different from the militaristic return of Christ. That it is a display of power that no one is questioning. It is just simply Christ coming back and everyone acknowledges that he is Lord. Largely based on something like uh, like uh, Philippians chapter 2, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, that it doesn't require him to basically ride in as a military commander. It just basically requires him to descend and say, See, I am the Lord. And then down here in the lower right, I'm looking at a picture of zombies rising from the dead. And that this has become, in our culture, within the last 10 years, a relatively popular trope of the end of the world because it focuses on this idea of people either contracting a disease or people physically rising from the dead and to do so in a way that they want to harm those who are living. And I find it interesting that specifically in the last 10 to 20 years, that this has almost supplanted the atomic bomb. That it's not just simply enough for the atomic bomb to kill people, or for a massive disease or biological warfare to kill people. 
but that the people who are killed by this will still retain some of their sentience, that they'll be enslaved enough to their hungers to start preying upon the living. And I'd like to point out that that's just our culture. Those are some of the more popular end-of-the-world scenarios in our culture. But it is interesting to me that most cultures, both ancient and modern, have a framework for discussing the end of the world. And that framework does not have to be religious. Well, as Christians, we have always had a particular fascination with the end of time because when Christ ascended, we have a promise of him returning. And when he returns, there is going to be a massive upheaval of the current conditions and a restoring of the way that things should be. And theologians have debated for centuries on what it will look like. And this debate commonly gets referred to as eschatology. Now, eschatology comes from the Greek word eschaton, which is simply the end. So eschatology is how do we talk about the end theologically? And for this lecture, I would like to submit a thesis that if it is ubiquitous, meaning all, cu all cultures have this idea of the end of times, then those theologies of the end times, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, will say an awful lot about that culture. If you want to get a peek into, well, what are their fears? What are, what are the things that drive them? What are the things that will make them move in a positive and or negative fashion? Look at their end times theology and see how it influences their day-to-day -day life. And so the first part of my thesis is that a culture's end time scenario is a window into their understanding and values. And this will have a postulate that it will frequently say more about them than it does about their deity. And so just for example, back to the previous slide, we showed two different reconstructions of Jesus, one coming back as a conqueror the other coming back in power and glory. And I would dare say that both of those could be legitimate interpretations of the scripture, but I think it says more about the person's society that drew those pictures that shows their expectations. And it says more about the artist and his view of God than it does about legitimate just biblical studies and trying to do exegesis of the text. And a third factor I'd like to point out about the thesis is that one of the leading factors that drives personal piety is going to be your end time scenario. If you have a view that it's going to be quick and sudden, you will probably have a theory, a, a plan of how am I going to live a effective life until that moment happens, but I'm not going to plan for anything after that. And so in some cases, like for example, at the turn of the first thousand years, we have reports of Christians selling most of their property and sitting around on hills waiting for the Christ to return. We saw that again in the in the mid 1800s when the Millerites made a similar prediction and thousands of people sold all their property and simply waited for Christ to return. Why would they do that? Well, the simple answer to that is their end time theology says you won't need this where you're going. And so they sold it. All right, so let's take an example of how millennialism could be a window into a non-Christian culture, and let's specifically look how Christianity interacted with that and even used their eschatological view in order to do evangelism. And so the example we're going to give is from Norse culture, or the, the pagan culture of Germany and the Scandinavian areas before 1000 AD. Now, to the left here on this slide, we have a picture of one of the Norse gods, Yggdrasil. And this is often referred to as the world tree, that there is this belief in Norse culture that there is a tree that is 
basically a cosmic tree that connects the nine spirit realms of the world together. And the Norse believed that so long as this tree was alive, that the earth would be connected to these eight spirit realms and thereby be connected to the gods. But if the tree ever died, this would be a sign that the ultimate battle at the end of time, Ragnarok, was going to be at hand. And so, because of this belief, many of the German or Hessian people or the Nordic peoples started to worship large oak trees and large ash trees. And they did so believing that these trees were avatars of the world tree, Yggdrasil. Well, the conflict with Christianity and this worldview comes up around 716 AD. <clears throat> A Catholic missionary by the name of Boniface is going to arrive on the scene and he's going to realize that these Hessians of Germany have this belief in this world tree and they are worshiping these large oak trees. And he realizes that their entire system is based on something rather fragile, a tree. Something that could be easily, well, let's say, cut down. And so he realizes that he could challenge their entire worldview simply by cutting the tree down. And so one of my colleagues from Cincinnati did a rather extensive thesis on this. And one of his conclusions was this. He says, quote, Alas, the deity did not step in and strike Boniface down. And the people experience a massive cogni cognitive dissonance. By all rights, the world should have been over for them when the oak tree fell. And they were likely expecting reality to shatter, if not literally, at least metaphorically. Well, seeing no backlash from the deity and no imminent destruction of the earth, the Hessians were forced to conclude that the oak lacked any of the reverence it deserved as an avatar of the world tree. Unquote. So, simply put, Boniface is engaging in what we could call eschatological warfare, that he is taking the views of a people group, and he is attacking that view in a place where if that isn't true, well, then their entire worldview falls apart. And the reason I point this out is because Christianity is highly wrapped up in a particular eschatological view. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ is being preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is futile and your faith is empty. Paul will basically go on to say that if there is no resurrection of the dead, Christianity is pointless. Don't join us. Pity us. And so I'd like to point out that while it's easy to scorn the German pagans for their hopes in eschatology being wrapped up in something so fragile as a tree, keep in mind that Christianity has a millennial weak point as well. And many people in our culture who are agnostic or atheist realize this, that it's the resurrection of the dead. And so what we find is that every Easter and every Christmas, we see many new books start to come out and many provocative series on like the Discovery Channel, where they'll specifically talk about Jesus. And more often than not, if it's an attack on what we would call Orthodox Christianity, it'll begin by saying, did the resurrection really happen? more often than not concluding that no, it didn't. And this too is a example of eschatological warfare because they realize just as well as Paul did that Christianity does have a weak point. Deny or disprove the resurrection and you have disproved the entire religion. And here's just one example of how this entire thing has played out. Back in 1980, there was the discovery of what has been called the Talpiot tomb, which was found near the city of Jerusalem. And this Talpiot tomb contained an ossuary, or a bone box, of a man, and the inscription on this ossuary said, Jesus, the son of Joseph. And after this find, many big-name documentary producers, such as James Cameron, just kind of jumped on this evidence 
and specifically that they tried to prove that Jesus never rose from the dead, and see, here is his body. It's the classic undermining of the apologetic. Well, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, why didn't they produce a body? Well, here's Cameron, you know, several thousand years later saying, see, here's the body. We finally have it. Well, it didn't take much for the biblical scholarly community, whether liberal or conservative, to respond to this, that they basically pointed out that the name Yeshua, or Jesus, and the name Joseph, or Yosef, was among one of the more common Jewish names of the period. And they basically pointed out that it you could probably have thrown a stone into a crowd and you'd have a high likelihood of hitting somebody named Jesus, son of Joseph. And this is often why they point out why the gospel accounts focus so heavily on the fact that Jesus is known as Jesus of Nazareth, because we're trying to narrow down, well, exactly which Jesus are we talking about? But again, keep all of this in mind that the eschatological warfare goes both ways, that there's a weak point to any eschatological point of view, and someone wishing to undermine it will usually attack that one point. And when it comes to eschatological warfare, I would like to point out that the Restoration Movement is particularly prone to being both a critique, or being both critiqued for its eschatology, and for critiquing others for their eschatology, largely because the Restoration Movement relies so heavily on the truth claims of the Bible that taking the Bible as their only source of information for how the church should be organized, for how the church should get its theology, that all of this focus on the Bible is going to make it imperative for the people of the Restoration Movement, as well as for us today, that they will participate in scholarly and critical dialogue to defend the biblical text. And for Alexander Campbell, this is really going to manifest in one of two ways. Number one, he's going to participate in numerous debates, particularly with uh, known uh, agnostic Robert Owen, to specifically point out the validity and the credibility of the scriptures as a book that a person could base their life on. And his second way that he's going to do this is that he's going to, to um, participate in what could be called scholarly religious journalism. He is going to read his scriptures, he is going to study the scriptures, and he is going to post his findings to further the body of knowledge on what the Bible means and better biblical scholarship. And I would like to suggest that as you students of mine who are here studying at a Christian university, that you are also part of this dialogue. That what you are accomplishing here in the realm of biblical studies can and does have implications for the future of Christianity. That our culture is going to constantly be asking questions. That there's going to be archaeological finds. There's going to be all kinds of evidence that will be mustered to say, see, Jesus never existed, or Jesus never rose from the dead, or the Christian church simply fabricated the Bible to suit their own needs. And in all of these cases, like Campbell, we are currently studying for the purpose of being able to discuss and, in a lot of cases, refute these ideas. And so I'd like to get you thinking about currently where our culture is. And our culture, if I could say so, has an obsession with death. That there have been many movies, there have been many video games, there have been many uh, just popular culture memes and references that show our current culture's outlook, and it is simply that we will suffer something worse than death, at least the majority of the people. And whether that is something like zombies rising or some kind of a, uh, a apocalyptic one-world government, that there is always something interesting 
that's going to happen and that there's only going to be a few people who are going to be left with a certain amount of freedom to do what they will. And I find it interesting that the heroes of almost all of these scenarios are people with guns. And specifically that they're these rough and tumble people who realize that if they're going to survive, they need to be able to kill with impunity. They need to be able to do the manly and macho thing. And I'd like to suggest that this is more of a, that this is more about our culture than it does about an actual end time scenario. That we live in a culture that because of their relative success in warfare, that we've become somewhat cocky that says, if the world did end this way, if people just suddenly went crazy, that I would be among the strong who, armed to the teeth, would be able to A, defend myself, and B, organize other similar people into a faction. I think in many ways it says something more about our willingness to, to fight wars for what we believe is right than it does about what we actually believe eschatology will look like. Okay, so let's shift gears here and actually talk about Christian eschatology. What makes the Christian view of the end of the world unique? And as you could probably guess, because it is Christianity, it is centered on Christ, the end-of-the-world scenarios of Christianity are always Christocentric, i.e. they revolve around Christ and often revolve around his second coming. And that they specifically uh, take many scriptures, like for example, 1 Thessalonians 4, and many of Jesus' teachings, uh, for example, in Matthew 24, and that they combine a lot of this stuff together, and they come to this conclusion that the return of Christ is imminent, meaning at any given moment, Christ could return. For example, here's how Paul puts it in 1 Thessalonians 4, quote, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are left we will be suddenly caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Unquote. Now, remember, as I said on the last slide, that many of these passages will have to be cobbled together, that there's no one book that just simply focuses on the end of the world. And often, many of these passages are paired with an understanding of Christ's imminent return that there will also be a thousand-year reign of Jesus over humanity. Now, there's only one place where this idea comes up at all, and that's Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 5. And it reads like this, quote, Then I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead or their hands. And they came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And this is why in Christian eschatological discussions. This is often referred to as millennialism. When will this 1,000 year or millennium of Christ's reign happen? And needless to say, there's not a lot to go on. There's just these two verses that talk about the millennium. And because of that, there has been quite a lot of speculation on what the millennium will look like. When will it happen? How will it happen? And because of that, four major theories have been produced by Christians throughout these centuries. And so, as we continue, here's where I get to give my little hot-button disclaimer, that when you talk about millennial theories, I've found that every Christian has them, and that they often can produce some pretty profoundly heated arguments when you start to discuss, well, what does it look like for Christ to return? And so I'd just like to say for the onset that we're going to discuss this from a historical point of view. And by that I mean we're going to ask, what did other people believe? And I'm not going to focus too terribly on what do I believe or what do you believe about the millennium. And so with all of this being said, yes, we all have our millennial views. 
Yes, we all probably believe in them very strongly. But what we're going to try to do here is try to ask, what drove the Restoration Movement? What was their view of the Millennium? And in order to do that, we're going to need to set the stage by pointing out what other groups have said about the Millennium to give an adequate contrast. Now, the four views we're going to look at are known as this. Historical premillennialism, which started in the 3rd century AD. A second view called amillennialism, which we find starting around the 4th century AD. And then two more recent ones, post-millennialism, which started in the 18th century, and then a more modern one that started in the late 19th century known as dispensational premillennialism. And you'll notice I've got four little icons here. All four of these millennial reconstructions have something in common. They have this green, yucky face, which I'll call the pre-Christian world, that before Jesus is born, we are down in the dumps, and this is an ugly, ugly place. And this is going to be the assuming starting point of all four of these views, that there is a ugly world pre-Jesus Christ. Now, on top of that, all four of these views note that there is a moment where Christ dies on the cross and things begin to radically change. Now, the question is, how do you interpret that radical change that we call the Christian era? And all four of these reconstructions will take a different view on what does it mean to live in the shadow of the cross. And then the third factor that we'll find is that there is the moment where Christ returns as evidenced by this down arrow, that this is going to be the moment that Christ descends down from heaven and that he does his thing, either bringing about the millennium or bringing the millennium to a close. And we'll talk about that in more detail with each of these. And then finally, all of these ideas have this understanding of the heavenly world, that there is a moment where Christ and all of the believers will be in heaven doing their thing. And so let's try to plot some of these on various graphs to show just how different all of these four views of millennialism are. So the first idea that we want to discuss is known as historic premillennialism. Now, this is going to be the earliest millennial view of Christianity. It's going to start around 200 and it's going to be fairly popular up until the time of Constantine. And the biggest reason why it's going to be popular is because it's going to match the early Christian worldview before it becomes the religion of the empire. Simply put, Christians understood that since Christ ascended, their situation has been getting worse and worse and worse. And therefore, this is what we see in this chart. We see the pre-Christ world where everything is yucky and ugly, down, way down near the bottom of how things could possibly get. And then all of a sudden, Christ is born and we take a massive upshoot that things are finally going right. And then once Christ comes, then we have this slow upward climb as he's doing his ministry. And then finally, it culminates at a high point with the cross that just at the moment when it looked like Christ was about to become king, he is crucified. But he also raises from the dead. He sets the church on a mission. But in that mission, things start getting worse. That Paul warns that there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing, that there's going to be a falling away. And so as Christianity progresses, situation gets worse and worse. Persecution comes up famines and droughts come up, and before you know it, we are all the way back down just as bad as it was just before Christ came. It's almost like it never happened, simply because of how bad things start to get. But just at that moment, right when it's getting at its worst, that's when Christ comes back. Bam. And you notice that the upshoot goes even higher than on his ministry. And then this is also, in this reconstruction, where the millennium starts, that little blue shaded area. And you notice that the blue shaded area has the people up on top living well, but it also has a underline where the non-Christians are basically living with the Christians and are finally incorporated into the kingdom. Either they convert 
or they are ruled over with a rod of iron. But in either case, during the millennium, we have the good and the bad still living together for a thousand years. And then finally, at the end of that thousand year period, that's when the judgment happens. And then all we're left with is the people living in heaven, in the heavenly happies. And so that is the historic premillennialism. And as I said, your millennial view often shows who you are as a culture. And it certainly shows the pre-Constantinian Christianity culture that after the rise, rise of Jesus and after the ascension of Jesus, the condition of Christians kept getting worse and worse until Constantine took over. Now, starting around 350 AD, a second competing millennial idea is going to begin to rise up. And this is known as amillennialism. Now, this comes from the Greek prefix of a, meaning no or not. And it basically says there is no physical thousand year reign, that the millennium is the church age, according to this reconstruction. And I find it interesting that around 350, it is it takes a much more positive view in light of Constantine having come to power, and Christianity is made the official religion of the empire. By 395, uh, the emperor Theodosius will make Christianity the only legal religion in the Roman Empire. And what this will mean is that Christians will stop seeing the world as getting worse and worse, and will simply say the church age is going to be pretty consistently good that we are bringing about this millennium, that Christ is reigning through the church and through emperors who become Christian. And this is going to basically notice that the church is conquering the civilized world, and it assumes that the church age, the i.e. the millennial reign of Christ, is coinciding with earthly rule. And so, in this reconstruction, we have the ugly world there, pre-Christ there at the beginning. We have the upshoot where Christ comes, and then we have the continuous slow climb of his ministry. And then at the moment of the cross, Christ dies, he is resurrected, he ascends, and at this moment, we start the church age. And you notice that we have two parallel black lines now. We have the church living high in the hog, and then we have the, the evil world still down there at the level where it was yucky pre-Christ. And all it takes to join the millennial reign is to simply convert and become a Christian. Now, one of the benefits of this reconstruction is that once the return of Christ happens, that's it. The good and the bad are judged. Those who have faith in Christ go on to reign with him in heaven forever. Those who are not are punished in perdition. And so we have everything in yellow, smiley face, happy land up there in heaven. And we don't have this physical millennium. And instead, the church age, for however long it lasts, could be 2,000 years, could be a whole lot longer if the Lord tarries. But in this reconstruction, the church age is taken as a metaphor for the millennium. So, starting around 750, we get to our third millennial point of view. And again, I find it interesting that this point of view comes about largely because of the age of European revolutions, that there's going to be the French Revolution, there's going to be the American Revolution, there's going to be technological revolutions like the Industrial Revolution. And in all of these ideas that we start to see that human beings can make a difference. And unlike amillennialism, where the church age is somewhat stagnant, Postmillennialism starts to actually be the opposite of premillennialism in that as the church age progresses, the world is going to get better. That people acting in the name of Christ will begin to make the world a better place and build on that, that framework that Christ has, has given us. And so in this reconstruction, we have the yucky pre-Christ world. We have what we saw in the last th three slides. We saw the jump the moment Christ comes. We see the slow rise of his ministry. And then we see the cross. 
But then we start to see a slow but gradual upturn that as Christ's people advance the gospel, as they begin organizing the world based on their principles, instead of the world staying somewhat stagnant, that we're going to see this steady rise of culture. We're going to see this steady rise of morality. And you notice that even the people living on the bottom who aren't converting to Christianity are reaping the benefits of this. And this would be very popular simply because when we see, like, for example, in the American Revolution, people started to have this, we can change the world sort of attitude. And when this happens, there starts to be this ex expectation of, well, maybe by changing the world, we can make the world a better place. And in making the world a better place, maybe we'll make the world so good, it'll be ripe and ready to call it the millennial kingdom of God. And so in the post-millennial mindset, here's what we see. We see the church age going on this constant upswing, and then eventually, at some point, we're not sure when, but at some point, boom, we are actually enter into the millennial reign of Christ. And for this thousand years, we are going to have a near-perfect society. Well, as we noted, this is called postmillennialism, and it's called postmillennialism because only after a thousand years of living in this perfect society does Jesus Christ return. And at this point, he judges the quick and the dead. He sends the evil to perdition. He sends the good to heaven with him. And then we live in yellow happy land from there on. And so notice here that the millennium is not brought about by Christ's return, but it's brought about by the work of people in the church. Now, postmillennialism, as you noted, is probably going to be a very optimistic, it's probably the most optimistic of all of the millennial views, because it basically has this kind of can-do attitude. But starting around 1900, that can-do attitude is going to be almost utterly destroyed. And it's going to be destroyed because of things like the American Civil War, the First World War, that we're going to start to see just mass destruction on a very wide scope. And so people are going to start to doubt whether or not the church age is actually making the world better. And so we're going to see a revival of premillennialism. But it's going to be premillennialism with a twist. And specifically, it's going to be brought about by a study Bible that was originally published by a man named Schofield. And in Schofield's view, he's going to try to take a very literalistic view of Revelation, and he's going to assume that there's multiple returns of Christ, that there's going to be a secret return of Christ when the rapture of the church happens, but then there's going to be a second and possibly even a third coming of Christ at the beginning and end of the millennial period. And this view is going to become very popular in the 1960s and 70s, and then once the 1990s come by with the Left Behind books, it's really going to take off in evangelical culture. And so, in this diagram, it goes like this. We got the evil, yucky world. We expect that. We got the coming of Christ and his ministry. Again, we expect that. And then we got the sharp downturn after the ascension of Christ, which in premillennialism, we expect that as well. But then notice we have a secret return of Christ where the church is taken away and the church age ends. And then you thought things were bad before. Then we have this period of tribulation, often based on various readings of the book of Daniel. And after this tribulation period, then we have a physical return of Christ where he sets up the millennial kingdom. And then you notice, even in this millennial kingdom, we still have the disparity of we have the good and the saints on the top, and we have the wicked who are basically being controlled and ruled over by the rod of iron again. And then finally, after the thousand year period, Satan comes back for one final showdown, Christ returns again and destroys Satan. The good are judged and sent uh, to heaven. The bad are judged and sent to perdition. And that is the fourth dispensational model. And this has largely become, at least in evangelical Christianity, probably the most popular millennial view at the moment. 
But unfortunately for this study, we're not going to be talking about what is the current view of the millennium. We're going to be interested in what was the view of the millennium during the time that the restoration movement was getting into high gear. And simply put, all of the people that we've studied here in this early first generation, Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, Elias Smith, Walter Scott, James O'Kelly, all of them will have this one thing in common, that they will be enamored with this can-do attitude of the new American Republic, and that they will start to say, you know what, I think this reform movement we are making in Christianity is part of this process of making the church age better and leading up to the point of the millennium. Now, as I pointed out at the beginning of this lecture, a person does not need to be Christian in order to have an end-of-the-world scenario. And for Americans, what this is going to mean is that even those who are not necessarily Christian will still buy into this post-millennial mindset. And here's the way Hatch puts it on page 184 of his book, The Democratization of American Christianity. He's going to say this, Americans of all ranks sense that events of truly apocalyptic significance were unfolding right before their eyes. And judging by the number of sermons, books, and pamphlets that address prophetic themes, the first generation of the United States citizens may well have lived in the shadow of Christ's second coming more intensely than any generation since. Unquote. And part of the reason for all of this is that as progress begins happening, Americans will start to get this idea that you want to be in the wake of our progress. Because not only are we living better, but you will live better too because of this progress. And I love this picture uh, here on the slide. This is uh, a art, work of art known as Lady Liberty Conquering the West or Manifest Destiny. And this will show how this millennial idea plays out in American culture. That we see Lady Liberty coming west, and so there on the right where Liberty's all already been, we have light, we have trains, we have stagecoaches, we have farming, we have agriculture, we have all of this good stuff that we call contemporary society and progress. Now, notice where there's to the left. There's darkness. There's Indians. There's the unknown. And as Lady Liberty is traveling west, that darkness is being pushed out. It's being dispelled. Because, well, we can't have darkness where this new post-millennial mindset is going. That if culture is getting better, it's getting better because of us. And notice that Lady Liberty is holding a book. And there's a lot of speculation on what this book could be, but if you're a post-millennial, you'll probably interpret that book as being the Bible. That part of what is bringing the light into this dark culture is the Word of God. And so there is going to be this need for our culture to conquer other cultures so that they can have the gospel. And this is what's going to be meant by manifest destiny, that Americans in general will start to see it as their duty to conquer the known world so that they can bring their version of progress and their version of the gospel to the masses. And just to give a couple millennial examples, here again is Hatch quoting Elias Smith. He says this, quote, Elias Smith stated that God had raised up Jefferson, now this is America's Thomas Jefferson, like Cyrus of Persia, to dry up the Euphrates of mystery, Babylon. Firmly grounded on the principles of liberty and equality, Jefferson's administration seemed to foreshadow the millennium. On the front page of the first edition of the Herald of Gospel Liberty, Elias Smith declared that the struggle for liberty and the rights of mankind set this age apart from all previous ages in history. According to Smith, the foundations of Christ's millennial kingdom were laid in the American and French revolutions. And so, again, notice what's happening here with that, you know, that idea of manifest destiny and postmillennialism coming together in a train wreck. It's basically saying that America's revolution 
is bringing about the millennium. And people like Jefferson, even though their Christianity is somewhat suspect, is a part of that process. And to give another example, Thomas Campbell, when he is writing his Declaration and Address, notes this on page 17 of the version that I've given you for this class, quote, Do ye not discern the signs of the times? Have not the two witnesses aris arisen from their state of political death from under the long prescription of ages? What shall we say of these things? Is it time for us to sit still in our corruptions and, div and divisions when the Lord, by his word and providence, is so loudly and expressly calling us to repentance and reformation? And notice what he's done there. Campbell has taken a verse from Revelation, the note of the two witnesses uh, who are supposedly preaching in Jerusalem in the Revelation passage, and he's taking that idea and he's saying that what we are seeing in the political turmoil and the political upswing of the post-American Revolution is a sign of these two witnesses, that we're not looking for physical prophets, we're looking for basically political change. And it's right there in his declaration and address, and it spurns him on to post-millennial thought that if it's the job of Christians to start making the world a better place, then where better to start than to heal the corruptions and divisions of Christianity? And so in a lot of ways, the restoration movement's drive for Christian unity is based on this post-millennial optimism that we can heal the rift in Christianity, and we can do so because of the scriptures. Now, this millennial idea is really going to kind of kick into high gear by the 1830s, and no one is going to be on board with this in the Restoration Movement, more so than Alexander Campbell. Now, Campbell is going to publish two periodicals in his lifetime. The first is going to be fairly iconoclastic, and it's going to be his magazine, The Christian Baptist. And his magazine, The Christian Baptist, is focused on really one thing. Can I tear down everything that's wrong with the church so that we can begin rebuilding in its place. But it's iconoclastic. It basically says, this is wrong with the church. This is wrong with the church. We've been doing it wrong here. We've been doing it wrong here. We've been doing it wrong here. Here's what the right way looks like. Well, what's going to end up happening is once the 1830s roll around, Campbell's movement is going to pick up quite a lot of steam. It's going to have several tens of thousands of people in the movement now. And he's going to start to see that maybe this movement is a part of bringing about the millennium. And so he's going to call his new magazine the Millennial Harbinger. And by this he's going to mean that, again, the millennium may obviously makes sense, but the word harbinger means something that brings about something. And so by calling his magazine the Millennial Harbinger, Campbell is effectively saying, this magazine is the messenger that is bringing about the millennium. That, our, that the reform movement we are doing is so powerful, it is so much in line with what God is doing, that it is going to help bring about this Christian millennium. And I think that this title speaks volumes about Campbell and his culture that he is coming from that the re reform of the Restoration Movement, at least according to Campbell, is going to bring about the millennium. It's going to have this high level of optimism. Now, one of the major results of this post-millennial mindset is that we're going to see the advancement of society-improving organizations. And these organizations are going to collectively be known as the Benevolent Empire. And so, as early as 1816, we're going to see the foundation of the American Temperance Society. This is a society that's going to encourage the abolition of alcohol. And by the 1800s, this is going to be in full swing, and Restoration Movement people like Carrie Nation are going to actually go into bars and smash the place up, specifically to say, we don't want this sort of thing here in our society, get it out. 
And a little bit later, we will see the passing of the Prohibition Amendment, the 19th Amendment. And so while it takes a little less than 100 years, notice that the American Temperance Society went from advocating abolition of alcohol to actually getting their wish within 100 years. Now, on top of that, we're going to see the establishment of an anti-slavery society in 1831. And this is going to have an even faster uh, result, because by 1860, America will start its civil war, and one of the major items on the agenda for that war is going to be the prohibition of slavery. Now, also in the 1820s, we're going to see the establishment of an anti-abortion crusade. And so, just keep in mind that the idea of abortion has been with us much, much longer than the 1970s when there was basically a sterilized medical procedure for it. That abortion has always been a problem that has plagued society. And specifically, one of the early Christian ideas of post-millennialism is going to be to end the murder of people who are in utero. Now, a fourth thing that's going to come from this is going to be this idea of women's suffrage, or giving women the right to vote. And this will start in 1848, and this too will be an idea of post-millennialism, that Americans can bring about change, and that that kind of change can... can uh, even challenge a status quo as ingrained as women play no major part in government. But I'd also like to point out that with all of these good things that are happening because of the post-millennial mindset, that there is one major drawback, and that is that American Christianity, and Americans in general, will develop a hero complex of sorts. Most American Christians that are living under this meta-narrative will begin to advance their own agendas and they'll assuming and they'll be assuming that they are helping to bring about Christ's kingdom and they may not too critically assess well what exactly are they doing or accomplishing what are they believing about this and because of that there's going to be some very deep seated connections with postmillennialism and the American Revolution and there's going to be this mentality that will emerge that bravery and bullets can change the world for Christ. Yeah, sure, we can try to fix the world by peaceful means. But you know what? If there's a bad thing out there, then we can stand up because of a just cause and that we can fight for it. And that we're not just fighting to stop something bad. We're fighting so that we can replace it with something good. And this will be part of the hero complex that postmillennialism will bequeath to America. And so now, even though postmillennialism is really not a major facet of American eschatology anymore, that mindset is still with us. That it is better to be conquered by America, and it is better to let us give you our culture than for you to maintain your own culture. Now, by the time of the Civil War, Christians on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line will be convinced, absolutely convinced, in postmillennialism, and they'll be convinced that the war they're fighting is a just cause and that God is with them. The sermons that are printed during this time, the letters that are sent home from Christians from the battlefield on both sides of North and South, will express a very strong millennial idea that what they're fighting for is they're fighting for the millennium, and they are fighting God's battle, because what they'll leave in its wake will be something closer to the kingdom of God than when they started. Okay, so let's wrap this whole lecture up in a, in a nice little present and put a bow on it. So, the first of our conclusions is that postmillennialism is born from the forge of the American Revolution, that because this revolution was successful, it will convince the American people that God has chosen this land specifically for something special. And our second conclusion is that this postmillennial idea will be one of the few uniting factors of the first generation of the Restoration Movement, that all of them will adhere to postmillennialism. They may be arguing left and right about, you know, 
the baptism question, the uh, question of revivalism. But there is one thing they can agree on, that they agree that postmillennialism is the best way to interpret the end of the world, and that their reformation is having something to do with that, that their, their contribution is helping to bring about the millennium. Now, a third conclusion is that the idea of limited progress of the church will spawn numerous organizations in America that will try to bring about ideas such as temperance or the abolition of alcohol, the abolition of slavery, and many other forms of what we could call disinterested benevolence. And by that, I simply mean that it will become very common, Christian or not, to say the best form of benevolent ministry is one where I don't stand to gain from something. That I simply do it because it's the right thing to do and it makes society a better place. But then our fourth conclusion is that the Civil War is largely going to bring this millennial optimism crashing to the ground. That it will be one of the most violent wars we've seen up to this point, that there is going to be massive death tolls in the hundreds of thousands, and after you've went through that, you're going to start asking yourself, is this really bringing about a millennium? Is this really making the world a better place? And so the post-millennialism isn't going to survive major wars of the late 1800s and early 1900s. That by the time of World War I, post-millennialism is going to be largely defunct in America simply because you can't fight a war with millions of people dead and still say, yes, I think that what we're doing with our, with our warfare, with our culture, is actually bringing about a better society.